The word music comes from the Greek musike, which literally means the art of the muses. On nine successive nights, Zeus, king of the gods on Mount Olympus, slept with Nemesina, goddess of memory. Nemesina, daughter of Uranus, the sky, and Gaia, the earth, was a titan, a member of an older generation of divine beings that came before the Olympians. Given the weird and whimsical way that reproductive biology worked among the Greek deities, it made perfect sense that Nemesina should give birth to nine daughters, one for each encounter with Zeus. It's also exactly what the scheming Zeus planned, to bring to life a bevy of female siblings to celebrate the victory of the Olympian gods over the Titans, and help people forget the troubles of the past. Each muse was gifted with a particular talent and could provide inspiration to any mortal seeking it in that domain. Calliope, for instance, specialised in epic poetry and was the one to whom Homer turned when writing his Iliad and Odyssey. Terpsichore held sway over dance and chorus. Euterpe was the muse of choice if you were a lyrical poet or writer of songs. An expert muse was on hand even if you were a historian or an astronomer. There were no male muses, though. The ancient Greek world was heavily androcentric, so that most inventions, including mythology, were the products of men. The gender of the muses was a male choice, but one guided by the perceived close association referred to by Plato, Socrates, and others between the act of creation and childbirth. The muses were depicted as having nymph-like qualities, youth, grace, and beauty, and in fact were sometimes described as if they were water nymphs being associated with the springs at Helicon and Pieris. The point is, there was a direct connection between the artistic and intellectual fertility they could supply and their physical fertility. For males to produce their poems and other creative works, the ironically male-invented myth was that they needed the inspirational spark of a youthful muse at the peak of her childbearing powers. But the muses weren't merely passive, nor was femininity their chief characteristic. Above all, they were goddesses, and that meant trouble for any mortal who rubbed them the wrong way. Mythical King Pierus of Emathia in Macedon was apparently one of their biggest fans, and referred to his nine daughters as the children of the muses, Unfortunately, this led to the girls growing up with an overinflated view of their skills, and they challenged the divine nonet to a singing contest which inevitably went badly for them. They then made the even bigger mistake of turning abusive. As punishment, they were transformed into magpies, birds known for their harsh and rasping calls. The Myris, a bard from Thrace, also fancied his chances against the Muses, and after being defeated, suffered an even worse fate. He was deprived of both his musical ability and his sight. It's very common to hear creative folks say that their ideas seem to come from outside rather than from within. They might attribute them to divine intervention, or if not communion with the gods, then perhaps with some unbidden channeling from the natural world. Other times, credit is given to a particular person as the source of inspiration, a human muse, who, much more often than not, is female and young. There are many examples of male composers and musicians who've identified certain women as being key to their creativity. Johannes Brahms and Robert Schumann both pointed to Clara Schumann, Robert's wife, in this regard. Chopin named Amantine Lucille Aurora Dupin, better known by her nom de plume, Georges Sande, as his muse. In some cases, the relationship had an overt romantic element, but in every case, even when a female muse had prodigious talent of her own, it was the man who won the greater fame and acclaim, and who is best remembered today. Throughout the ancient world, there were sharp distinctions between the roles and rights of men and women. In Greece, women weren't considered citizens and therefore couldn't vote, own land, or inherit. Even females in high-status families were expected to centre their lives on the home and the raising of children. Of course, the same remained true in much of the West until less than a century ago. 
except in Athens, for which plenty of records survive, details in other city-states are less clear and always seen through the prism of male authors. Sparta was different in that women had to do physical training like the men and were permitted to own land and drink wine, but with few exceptions, Greek women weren't expected nor encouraged to come up with new ideas or works of their own. It was the male, inspired by an appropriate muse, who created and pushed the envelope of artistic and scientific endeavour. As in all places and times and all fields, women of outstanding talent and tenacity occasionally rose above the limitations of their society. Among these were the philosopher Areti of Cyrene, the physician Agnodice of Athens, the astronomer and mathematicians Hippatia, and Aspasia of Athens, a formidable intellect and the only politically significant female of ancient Greece. Aspasia opened a school in Athens to give girls a better standard of education, and her house became a popular intellectual meeting place for writers and thinkers, including Socrates. Yet her rise to a position of influence began with her accepting the role of heteria, a high-class and well-educated prostitute, before becoming the consort of statesman and general Pericles. Music was tremendously significant in Greek society. It appeared as folk music and the ballad-like recital of epic poetry and was played in the theatre, at weddings, funerals and religious festivals and ceremonies and for entertainment at drinking parties or symposia. Very often music was combined with dancing or poetry. Musica, remember, the art of the muses was a broader term than our music embracing song, word, dance, and instrument playing. Again, the roles of the sexes were sharply delineated, and most of what we know about women in music comes from the writings of men, and the depictions by male artists in, for example, paintings on vases and walls. In his greatest works, Republic and Laws, Plato wrote at length about the importance of music in Greek life and culture. Some of his views look pretty modern and, by the standards of his time, quite liberal towards women. He's even been referred to as a proto-feminist. An in-depth music education was essential for both boys and girls, he insisted, beginning in infancy and extending to the age of 20. He prescribed three years of training on the lyre, starting when the child was 13, and extensive vocal coaching. Education he regarded as being coextensive with choric song, combining vocal rhythms and modes with rhythm in bodily movements. Ultimately, for him, the purpose of music training wasn't to develop musical expertise, but to cultivate the soul. As he says in Laws, the vocal aspect reaching the soul we regarded as education in virtue, and we named it music. But Plato was far from even-handed in his musical prescriptions for boys and girls. He reflected and even amplified the notion prevalent in male-dominated Greek thinking that men and women were of fundamentally different natures and must be raised and educated accordingly. Her voice, carriage, manners and outlook become definitely feminine, suited to the capacities of her sex and expressive of its nature. In The Republic, he makes a clear distinction between the types of songs he considers suitable for men and those suitable for women. Certain modes and rhythms are characteristic of each. Male songs, he says, tend to be grand yet restrained and simple, reflecting masculine qualities, as the Greeks perceive them, of leadership and courage. Music appropriate for women would be softer, orderly and discreet, taking account of their again, as then seen, effeminate and pliant yet fickle nature. Aside from differences in rhythm, masculine music would be made up largely from tones, whole notes, while feminine music would contain semitones or even smaller intervals. These seeds of musical discrimination would grow over time and in other places, leading eventually to a widespread suppression in medieval Europe of feminine compositions and female involvement in music. 
Plato was writing about what he saw as an ideal educational system to service a just and ideal city-state run by philosophical guardians. In practice, the quality of education in Greece varied a lot between the sexes and social classes, and at different times and places. In the 4th century BC, when Plato lived, education was more available to girls than it had been earlier, and it was around this time that a sharp distinction started to be made between what were regarded as respectable and shameful female musicians. The former were taught from a very young age by reputable teachers and might go on to become professional musicians paid to perform during public festivals. An inscription from 186 BC mentions that Polygnata from Thebes was given a crown and 500 drachmas for her performance at the Pythian Games at Delphi. She recited and played the Cathara, from the name of which comes guitar, a multi-stringed lyre strummed with a plectrum in the right hand, while strings to be left unsounded were damped by the outstretched fingers of the left. In contrast to this considered respectable class of musical females were the prostitute musicians who were hired to dance, perform sex acts and play erotic love tunes on the aulos, a reed instrument equivalent to an ancient oboe, and cellis, a seven-string lyre, at men's drinking parties. Many of them started as slave girls, some captured in battle, others sold into slavery by impoverished parents. As in the case of Aspasia, who we mentioned earlier, as well as being physically attractive, the Hetairai were often highly educated and musically trained in special schools because they were expected to be good intellectual companions to men as well as sexual partners when requested. Their musicianship, however, was seen as unsavoury, even though their profession only existed in the first place to service men wanting to be entertained and have sex with attractive, talented females. Although men and women were able to become professional musicians, certain instruments were considered more appropriate for one gender or the other. Horns and larger types of lyre, were thought of as being masculine because they were the ones that made louder sounds and were typically played by men who marched in military parades or performed at general public events. Women and girls tended to play various types of harp, the aulos, and smaller lyres. After the 4th century BC, women began to take up lute-like instruments such as the panduros with its several strings and long neck. Female musicians, along with singers and dancers, would perform at parties for women, in ceremonies connected with rites of passage, and in large state religious festivals. Female worshippers of Dionysus and other deities linked to fertility would play percussion instruments like the timpanos, a drum, and kimbala, cymbals. Amateurs would play for their own pleasure, while some professional female musicians despite the overwhelming male chauvinism in society, still managed to make a name for themselves. Of all the women involved with music in ancient Greece, the best known today are the lyric poets, only a few of whose work has survived. Lyric poetry was intended to be sung either by a soloist or a chorus, and was often accompanied either by a stringed instrument, typically a lyre or kithara, or an aulos, all of the best-known female lyric poets who rose to prominence between the 6th and 3rd centuries BC were well-educated and wealthy and came from outside Athens, where women's lives were much more circumscribed. Carina from Viotia in central Greece, Erina, Gnosis, who specialised in epigrams, and Anaiti from the central Peloponnese, and who wrote on rural themes, are among those praised in their day and remembered still today. Another was Telesilla of Argos, a city in the Peloponnese who lived in the 5th century BC and was later included by Antipater of Thessalonica, a Roman writer, in his list of the nine female lyric poets of Greece. Legend has it that to find a cure for the constant ill health in her youth, she consulted an oracle 
who advised her to dedicate her life to the muses. Thereafter, she studied music and poetry, was quickly healed, and won fame for her poetic works. She's also said to have rallied the women, young men, elders, and slaves of her hometown to repel invading Spartan forces after the defending army had been beaten. One name, though, stands out as the greatest and most famous of female Greek lyricists, Sappho. She's the only woman to be found in the canonical group of nine lyric poets esteemed by Hellenistic scholars to be worthy of critical study. The list that Antipater later countered with his alternative canon of female-only poets. Sappho, born around 612 BC on the island of Lesbos, wrote on themes that were personal and frequently erotic. Setting the rhythms of her native Aeolian dialect to new melodies, she penned stanzas mostly for solo singing with accompaniment by the lyre or harp. Her most vivid lines capture deep female emotions. Once again, that loosener of limbs, love, bittersweet and inescapable, crawling thing, seizes me. There's also ambiguity in her words, often suggesting that she's writing about the love and lust of one woman for another, hence the origin of lesbian. One thing needs to be made clear. We actually know very little for certain about Sappho, beyond where and when she lived, and some of the things she wrote. Not surprisingly, she's attracted a lot of attention over the ages because in writing about love and sensuality, especially for women and girls in the cult of Aphrodite, goddess of love, pleasure and procreation, she touches on our more primal instincts. Here's one of her most famous poems, known today as Sappho 31. He seems to me equal to gods, that man, whoever he is who opposite to you sits and listens to your sweet speaking and lovely laughing. Oh, it puts the heart in my chest on wings, for when I look at you even a moment, no speaking is left in me, no tongue breaks, and thin fire is racing under skin, and it eyes no sight, and drumming fills ears, and cold sweat holds me, and shaking grips me all greener than grass I am, and dead or almost seem to me. What a fabulous, powerful description. It would be fascinating to be able to go back and hear what this sounded like when sung with musical accompaniment. Sappho is the first person in history to give such an outward expression of the emotions of desire and the extremes of love. The great puzzle, of course, is who is speaking. At first sight in the English translation, it isn't clear if it's a man or a woman. However, the gender-specific grammar of the original Greek gives the game away. The word greener in the phrase greener than grass am I is given as chloroterra with a feminine ending, dispelling any doubt that the speaker is female and by inference Sappho herself. Sappho seems to have been the first person to describe the moon as silvery, leading to many reuses of the description as in the song By the Light of the Silvery Moon, also the association of bittersweet, indicating both pain and pleasure, with love appears to have originated with her. In fact, many of the lyrics that we see popping up in modern songs, sung by the likes of Madonna, Katie Lang and Shania Twain, make their first appearance in lines by Sappho. Regarding Sappho's sexuality, the terms lesbian and sapphic to mean woman for woman love and sexual desire are very new. Ancient Greek attitudes to relations between sexes were quite different from ours. Sex and love to the Greeks were as much to do with the mind as the body, and same-sex relationships were seen as normal and educative. There were no expressions, for example, for gay or bisexual, and the boundaries between sexes were more fluid and subtle. When Sappho writes in such stirring and evocative tones, it isn't to titillate or descend into word pornography, but rather to bring the audience, typically of young women and girls, together to experience a sophisticated mix of emotions, pivoting on desire and passion, but never descending into crudity. Also, this is a world where gods and goddesses were part of everyday reality and must be appeased. Sappho organized her young female students into a cult 
that worshipped Aphrodite with lyrical poetry and many of the thoughts of yearning expressed in her works are directed at pleasing this particular deity. Some of the great men of Greece held Sappho in the highest possible regard. Plato wrote, Some say there are nine muses, but how careless, look again, Sappho of Lesbos is the tenth. Solon, the Athenian statesman and himself a poet, heard his nephew sing a song by Sappho at a drinking party and asked the young man to teach it to him. When someone asked him why he was so eager to learn it, he replied, So once I learn it, I may die. In Sappho, we find a woman who transcends her time and the limitations placed on her and her sex by a patriarchal society. Not only does she rival in skill the greatest male lyric poets of her age, but by virtue of the insights only her gender can provide, goes beyond that of which any man is capable. Throughout history, there will always be such women, but already, more than two and a half thousand years ago, the barriers to female progress in music are plain to see, and many will remain in place over centuries to come. The idea that the woman exists to support the man, to look after his home and children, so that he can be the doer, the explorer of new ideas, the creator, would persist. Even the woman or the goddess who is a muse is not a musician, not the one who brings the music to fruition and wins praise for doing so, but is merely the facilitator. Worse, if the music associated with women were seen as having qualities inferior or even subversive to those of masculine music, then it might be suppressed, and women as composers and musicians to be taken seriously might be erased from view. <laughs>